Well now, this is the slide I skipped. Here we are on slide 28, pathogenic fungi and protists and the diseases they cause. Um, it's good right now to make sure we all know what pathogen and pathogenic mean. Pathogen is an organism that is able to cause a disease. Pathogenic, it means able to cause a disease. So let's skip ahead through those slides we already looked at and we'll get to this one, informal classes of pathogens. This is something I do that is not a standard thing in microbiology, um, but I classify diseases ba partly in this way whenever it's appropriate. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Some diseases are called by, caused by toxins that microorganisms make. Food poisoning is an example of this, where the only thing that causes the disease is the is the toxin. It doesn't matter if the organism you're eating is dead or alive, the toxin it made is what's going to make you sick. So botulism is an example of this. And so I will put this in the upper right corner when I first introduce um, a disease that's just an intoxication. This would be an irritation, and what you're seeing here is um, villi in the intestine with bacteria all over them causing an inflammatory response. Um, and in these cases, sometimes I'll call it inflammatory, in these cases the microorganisms grow on a person or in a person, but they don't cross an epithelial barrier. So they're going to be in the lumen of a gut, or they're going to be on the skin, etc. And the signs or symptoms we see from these are caused by the immune response, usually. Um, and then the last one are the invasive diseases. These happen when a pathogen does cross an epithelial barrier and spreads to different parts of the body. It could be spreading a few inches away, or it could go through the bloodstream to completely different organs. And what you're seeing here is another diagram from a different paper that's showing ways bacteria cross epithelial uh, layers in the gut. Dendritic cells can pull them out of the lumen, and pathogens can just survive in the dendritic cell and hop out of the dendritic cell. Other pathogens will trick the cell into using vesicular transport and um, transport mechanisms within the cell to cross the epithelial layer completely and get into whatever is uh, deep to that layer. Okay, so when you see these um, these icons, they're just supposed to help you remind you what you're seeing and I'll typically put these on a slide where I introduce a new pathogen so I'm not going to put them on every slide but you'll see them from time to time so just note them and remind yourself what they mean okay so the first um, example we get are the fungal intoxications and that right there in the name you can see it has to do with the toxin and in all of these cases the fungus is going to grow make some molecule for some unknown reason like a protein or a small molecule um, on the scale of an amino acid um, that is very toxic to us. And so they're making this, it's in their cytoplasm, and when we eat them, we break open the cells, we get the toxin and we absorb it, and it hurts us. So we kill these fungi when they grow, in, or when we eat them, we kill them. I mean, they, they die in our stomach, but their toxins live on. So the, the important uh, terminology right now is mycotoxin, that is a toxin yeah, made by a fungus. And then another name for fungal intoxication is mycetism. And so you'll see that from time to time. Just be aware of what mycetism means. Our first example of a, um, a fungal intoxication are the aflatoxins. And these are a group of protein toxins made by aspergillus molds. So these are these are fungi that um, they're very common. They're everywhere in the world, pretty much. They grow as these black, dirty-looking molds. Um, and the the main thing they do here is cause allergic reactions. So a lot of people who are allergic to mold, this is one of the molds they are allergic to. But much more seriously, they produce aflatoxins. And these are toxins you'd be exposed to if you ate something that was contaminated with um, aspergillus. So um, what do those do? Well, they cause um, liver damage. 
and this can ultimately lead to an increased risk of liver cancers. And so if a person eats aspergillus contaminated foods um, for a long period of time, every time they eat them, they're exposed to these toxins. Every time they're exposed to these toxins, their chances of liver damage and cancer increase. And so you can imagine someone who has access only to contaminated foods is eventually going to have a high risk of um, liver cancers. So um, that's the main thing I would say about that. Um, we screen our food in the developed world for, for aflatoxins uh, because we know this is a problem. And the people who are going to be at risk are people who grow their own foods and store their own foods or anyone who is um, buying low-cost foods that have not been screened. So uh, we do have to be a little bit nervous around some imported foods in particular that might not have been screened. And so this, this last bit down here is, um, is just some evidence for how serious this is. So if you look at the cancers that are common in sub-Saharan Africa, 50% of them are liver cancers. Well, compare that to liver cancers here in the U.S. and you'll find a very different number. Um, and at the same time, aflatoxin is really common in foods in sub-Saharan Africa. And so that kind of indirect linkage strongly points to how significant a problem is with these aflatoxins. Um, and occasionally they also cause acute, um, acute liver damage. And so one large batch of uh, contaminated grains can expose a lot of people. And I'm not sure really what uh, distinguishes between the strains that are going to cause the acute um, damage or chronic damage. Just, just be aware that aflatoxins span that range from something that will make someone sick um, over a short amount of time to some that will increase their cancer risk over a long amount of time. Right, so do be careful with um, imported foods that might not have gone through typical testing. Another uh, mycetism that has been known pretty well throughout history um, and is also nasty is ergot. And this is made by one particular uh, species um, of fungus that grows in rye and a few other grains. So what you see here is a structure, a fungal structure coming out where um, the fungi are growing. And these make different um, toxins, but if a person were to eat this, they would get essentially nervous system symptoms. Damage to the nervous system can lead to damage to a lot of other systems, including um, muscles and skin, and so that has been seen historically. And so um, th these fungi have been blamed for um, major military setbacks, for example, and other situations where a nervous system disease has become very prevalent very quickly. And one could imagine if you're trying to feed an army and you have contaminated grain you're feeding to everyone, yeah, they will all get sick and they'll be less effective at what they're trying to do. So this is, again, not very common these days, um, but it's always a possibility. Um, the most acutely dangerous um, sort of mushroom poisoning or fungal poisoning is mushroom poisoning. And the, the worst poisons are the amatoxins from Amanita phylloides, the death cap mushroom. This is the... Um, the mushroom that causes the most fatality is when people want to use mushrooms as food. So um, if a person comes in who is severely sick, who's been eating um, mushrooms they found in the wild, this is really something to, to think about. So um, typically half a day after eating mushrooms, um, they'll get these severe gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, but then that will transition to um, damage to the urinary um, system and the, the liver. And so that will immediately cause much more severe problems. And so someone would be hospitalized uh, by this point and probably die. Um, if they survive, they recover slowly. So 
Unfortunately, there are no um, antidotes to this, but a person will benefit from supportive therapies and it will increase their chances of survival. So that's a, that's a good thing to know is if, if you can identify that this has happened, even though you can't directly treat the toxin, you can help keep a person alive until um, the toxin wears off. Um, much more common would be the non-inflammatory gastroenteritis for mushrooms. So gastroenteritis is going to be inflammation or irritation to the gastrointestinal system, the, mostly the intestines. Um, and so what a person would see after eating um, lots of different mushrooms, which can cause this, is um, severe gastrointestinal symptoms that come very quickly after they eat the mushroom. So the body reacts very quickly to these. So there are cases where a person would start vomiting and have diarrhea 20 minutes after eating these mushrooms. Um, so this is just a big catch-all term for lots of different mush mushroom toxins, lots of different species of mushroom, um, but generally they do have these things in common. They have a very quick incubation time between eating and symptoms and most common um, symptoms or signs, I guess, are the severe vomiting, severe diarrhea that, that happen very quickly. Um, and again, there, there are no antidotes for these um, toxins, but also in, in most cases, there, a person would recover. Another um, well-known cause of fungal intoxications are um, or the fungi from uh, the claviceps, uh, genus and these make ergot and those are a, a group of toxins that can cause nervous system effects and nervous system damage and so what you're seeing in this picture here is a growing um, piece of grain rye or something I'm not sure exactly uh, with a fungal structure blooming out of it and so this would be the the, um, the claviceps uh, fungus with the normal grain it grows in. And so the difference really between this and um, aspergillus is that this is going to grow um, in grains that are healthy, as far as I know, whereas um, aspergillus is going to grow in harvested grains that are in storage. What we see with ergot is more nervous system effects. And again, this is not very common here. Um, but historically it was seen pretty often because if this fungus was very prevalent in an environment, all the food people could grow there would be infected. And so there have been situations where an army has had to turn back because um, the food was contaminated and people would be badly poisoned um, by ergot. Okay, next are the um, amatoxins, and these are the most dangerous um, Acutely, these are the, the toxins that are most likely to kill a person within a few days as opposed to slowly causing um, accumulating damage. So these are the toxins made by um, Amanita phylloides, the death cap mushroom, and this is by far the most common cause of fatal mushroom poisoning. So this is specific to situations where people are using mushrooms as food. They're going out into the wild, finding mushrooms and eating them. And so this is the big major risk people take when they pick wild mushrooms. So it is absolutely important that anyone who's ever going to do that knows um, a lot about identifying mushrooms. So what happens when a person eats one of these mushrooms or a small number of them is nothing for 10 hours or so, about half a day, but then they will start getting um, strong... Uh, what's the word, gastrointestinal symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea. And that can lead to dehydration. Anytime a person has extensive vomiting or diarrhea, they're losing a lot of fluids. And so um, dehydration would be one of the first things you'd notice. And then um, they will typically see a remission in those signs. They would, you know, stop having the diarrhea, but... Um, they will start to see failure in the liver and kidneys. So um, severe damage to these organ systems. So um, either those, the multiple organ failure will, will kill them or they will have a slow recovery. And 
Um, while we don't have any specific antidotes, there's no drug a person can take that will reverse this poisoning, um, there is a, a, a good chance that if we treat someone and support their kidney and liver function, um, various drugs that can protect um, the liver, various drugs that can protect the kidney, that sort of thing, um, a person's chances of survival are greatly increased. So um, getting someone to medical attention if they start to have um, gastroenteritis half a day after eating mushrooms is a very good idea. More common than that are the um, non-inflammatory gastroenteritis. And these this is a catch-all term, I have to say, for a lot of different mushrooms that all cause um, gastrointestinal problems. And what they have in common is a very, very short incubation time. So the time between when a person eats the mushrooms and when they start to get severe uh, vomiting and diarrhea could be as short as 20 minutes in some cases, and as, as long as two hours. But either way, it's distinct from what a person would see if they ate Amanita phylloides. Um, and so this is much less likely to be fatal um, because the, the primary damage or the primary symptoms are the, um, the gut strongly rejecting um, the mushrooms that contain these poisons. That's what's happening. The gut is successfully protecting a person from the toxins. But if enough of the toxins are ingested or if the body is not able to excrete them, they will again start to damage the internal organs. And so this, this can lead to fatal poisonings. Um, and from what I've read, it ends up looking a lot like um, what a person would get from the death cap uh, mushroom. Um, and again, treating or supporting a person's organ function and treating their dehydration are um, very good things to do in these cases. But really, when we think about mushroom poisoning, the main thing is not ever eating any mushroom you can't identify very confidently. So um, I'll leave it at that. These are uh, fungi that, instead of being eaten, these grow on our skin. Um, the, the first one and the main one are dermatophytoses, caused by dermatophytes. And um, these are common things like athlete's foot. Lots of different uh, uh, fungi can cause them. And what they do is they can secrete an enzyme that breaks down the keratin in skin, and that gives them a source of food and the ability to live um, there. But they, yeah, they don't invade living tissues. That's why I gave them this um, this icon. So people get them from direct contact with things like pets, but only in situations where there's humidity. So um, athlete's foot, for example, is named that because people would get it from um, shower rooms, like locker rooms. So if um, if skin touches a surface in a locker room, that, pers that skin is at risk of getting one of these um, dermatophytoses. And again, phyto means plant, so people thought, people used to name microorganisms after plants, it doesn't make sense. These are different types of cutaneous mycosis or dermatophytosis. Um, and they're just named after where they happen in the body. Um, let's see. So you can read through that. Um, and so here's a little bit more detail on all of them. And I don't have more information for you than what is in these slides, so I'm just going to um, scroll through them and you can read through them. Um, and then on this slide I have some pictures. Um, the one thing I will point out is that um, ringworm, so, sorry, um, head ringworm, nail ringworm, and body ringworm on the previous slide, yeah, there are no worms involved. It's it's a uh, fungus, but ring comes from the fact that you would see an expanding patch of um, of inflamed tissue, 
And then this is where they're infecting the nail and they're causing the nail to be yellowed and brittle. So how do we treat them? Well, there are topical antifungal medications like imidazole. Um, and if a person is very sick or has a suppressed immune system um, and these fungi can get out of control, that is treatable also. But really, air and dryness are what stop them from growing. Um, and we can prevent transmission if we keep people away from cats, dogs, and farm animals. So that's where a lot of people will get them, is from, from animals um, and showers, etc. So those were the cutaneous mycoses or dermatophytoses. Um, next we have Candida albicans, and I've mentioned this a few times. It is a mitosporic yeast, which means no one has ever found um, sexual reproduction in it. Um, why does that matter? Well, that matters because f fungi are classified based on their type of sexual reproduction. The same way that we can classify plants based on their flowers, um, the flowers are the sexually reproducing parts, and those are the slowest parts of the plant to change by evolution. In the same way that in these fungi, um, the sexually reproducing structures are the slowest to change by evolution. So you can classify them and come up with a phylogeny based on their sexual reproductive structures. So a uh, mitosporic yeast doesn't have any. Um, and that means until we had things like DNA analysis, we didn't know where they went in the phylogeny. So, Canada albicans is a member of the normal human microbiota. That means it lives on us and in us and doesn't cause any diseases. And we would find it on the skin, in the mouth, um, in the vagina, in the intestines. But it also causes lots of um, disease states, as we will see. So in that book I showed you, Clinical Microbiology Made Ridiculously Simple, this is an example of one of the mnemonic devices. Um, as clinicians, you'll see it again and again. Um, it's given out like candy. See? Candy? Candy? See? Um, that's what it is. So the first of these diseases is thrush, or um, oral candidiasis, I believe it is called. Um, and this is caused by dysbiosis. So we typically think this is going to happen whenever um, the normal microbiota, like the bacteria that should live there, if they're disrupted and unable to, um, unable to grow, then a person might get um, thrush. And there, there are treatments uh, for this. We have antifungals we can use. Um, and that's what you would, that's what you would see. Um, a mixture of uh, the yeast themselves and, I believe, white blood cells. Uh, vaginitis, or a yeast infection, um, is a similar condition where Canada albicans grows because the normal bacteria that are there are unable to prevent it. Normally, the vagina has that low pH caused by lactobacillus bacteria that release lactic acid. And they do that because the epithelium um, lining the, the vaginal canal um, releases sugars that they can use as an energy source. And the other sort of antimicrobial um, chemicals released into the vagina are not toxic to lactobacillus. They're much more toxic to everything else. So... Um, lactobacillus are kind of invited to grow there, and when they're not doing their job, that's when you would get something like Candida albicans, um, or many other diseases. Um, and so when do we see that kind of dysbiosis? When do we see that disruption of the bacterial community? Well, somebody taking broad-spectrum antibiotics will kill the lactobacillus. But any major hormonal changes, like pregnancy or things caused by contraceptives or the, just changes in the menstrual cycle, um, those can cause um, disruptions to the lactobacillus and um, the basic chemical environment of the vagina. Um, and there are treatments for this that are straightforward. 
Um, other places we would see Canada, and this, this again is a diagram from that same book, um, and I'll, I'll walk you through this in a minute, is in people who are immunocompromised, such as people who have HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. If it's not treated, that virus leads to AIDS, or um, acquired immunity deficiency syndrome. In that syndrome, a person loses their T cells. And as their T cell count decreases over years, they go through different phases where they have different kind of health impacts because of that. And so what this is showing you, this is part of a bigger graph on the following slide. And what it's showing you is this line represents um, the T cell count over time. So this is years, roughly, and this is T cell count. And this line started at around a thousand with a healthy person, and by the time it gets down around 400, a person will get um, extra cases of cutaneous mycosis or candidiasis or other infections that a healthy person wouldn't get as often. Um, as the T cell count gets even lower, like down to 200, a person could get, um, I believe there's some, no, these are not, these are not Canada. Sorry, I got carried away. But different diseases that never affect healthy people um, become really significant once a person's T cell count gets a little low, like 200 or 250, and then once it goes below 50, a person doesn't survive for very long. Um, so under normal circumstances in a healthy person, Canada is not going to penetrate tissues or even cause really inflammation. But a person with a lower T cell count can't control it. And that tells us that the T cells are controlling Canada most of the time. So no one really understands why it's able to grow in us without causing disease sometimes, and it causes disease at other times. That's not really a perfectly understood thing, but partly our immune system plays a role in that, and partly the other microorganisms that grow on us play a role in that. Um, what happened? Oh, uh, diaper rash. Yes, that's another thing. This is... Um, this is the that whole that whole graph, and what I would point out is that um, the the person who draws these draws viruses and um, well these different microorganisms in this different way. So if you look up here, this is a fungus, whereas this is a protist, and you just get that pretty quickly as you read this book, and it makes it easier to draw mnemonic devices like this. So I'm going to end this video here because this is the end of the intoxications and um, irritations or inflammations. So I will see you at the next video.